Welcome to this live session hosted by Fab, your insurance broker and moving to France expert. Fab is like your immigration GP. We're here to answer all your questions. Visas, residency, healthcare, driving, taxes, properties, and much more. We navigate the complexities of France to help you embrace the French lifestyle you've always imagined. Although we are experts in the immigration industry and have been working in this space since 2015, none of what we say should be considered legal or financial advice. It is also worth noting that the immigration industry is an ever-evolving field, so things that are relevant today might be outdated or inaccurate when you actually move to France. FAB's main source of revenue is insurance through our brand, FAB French Insurance. Our main goal is to ultimately help you move to France, as we only sell insurance to clients applying for a visa, a residency permit, or those with a French address. During the session, you can ask any questions you want. However, we will not answer long questions to keep the pace fast. We also won't be able to address questions related to personal or very specific issues. But rest assured, we can get in touch after this session to either advise or refer you to one of our trusted partners. And now it's time to get this event started. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you find our answers valuable. Our greatest reward would be to be a part of your journey to moving to France. And hopefully, it starts with this session today. We will pause briefly to allow all registrants to join. The session will begin shortly. back thank you all for joining today thank you for attending always always more of you that that's really heartwarming and uh, so so we'll be today we'll be talking with the experts uh you'll have nanny or american expat in the background answering uh, your questions when she can or helping you uh getting you through the right direction and uh, we'll have the, the two experts this evening in france uh, Catherine, um, an expat herself, uh, a British expat who just got French citizenship. Congratulations. And Sandra, who is our uh, tax lawyer uh, we work with very often. So uh, you have a panel of experts for you today. Uh, just before we get started, uh, a quick housekeeping because this uh, session uh, is about a GID business, but we can extend to property rentals in France. However, um, I know these are French words, so uh, just so that we're not confused, uh, the definition for stuff, like in France, a gîte is when you're renting out an independent building that is furnished and, and include at least a bathroom and a kitchen. And obviously you're letting out the, this part of the property for less than 90 days. Um, a chambre d'hôte that you might have heard as well, is when you're subletting part of your own house with shared access to common areas such as the kitchen or the bathroom, well, and the bathroom. And then the bed and breakfast is a different uh, type of activity in France because this is considered a professional activity at this stage and you need to be registered as a business in France, although that could be kind of a small sort of business, same as self-employed. Uh, and obviously, ends the title, you need to include at least breakfast uh and if you do a bed and breakfast so very important to know if you consider a bed and breakfast in france it's limited to five bedrooms maximum and 15 or and or 15 guests at the same time if you exceed that then you get in a different category kind of like an hotel although not technically an hotel but it gets a bit more tricky and bed and breakfasts needs to be registered with the local city city hall which we call the mairie uh, in france Everything else pretty much is just holiday rentals or letting out an entire, entire property would be considered holiday rentals. Now that we've cleared these issues, uh, or potential issues, I'll ask Sandra and Catherine if you don't mind to turn your camera back on and uh, we'll get this session started. Hello, you two. 
So uh, I'm Fabian. Uh, I'm your host this evening, uh, founder and managing director of Fab Insurance and Fab Expat Services. Uh, I'm glad to be with Sandra, uh, immigration lawyer at Lexity, and Catherine from Survive France Network. What might be, uh, I'll let Sandra introduce herself and Lexity potentially. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sandra Vanier, and I have been a French tax and corporate uh, lawyer for nine years. Uh, since this year, I work for Lexity France, where I bring my expertise. Um, our mission is to support and assist individuals or companies who wish to settle in France. We do everything in our power to facilitate their integration and success in France, help them to obtain their visa, the right one, very important, set up their business or company, or give them specific tax advice on their situation. Thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, we've been working with Sandra a lot. She does also do one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations, you know, when you don't know basically the tax situation you might be in, you know, when coming from abroad, this is very useful. Uh, and, and obviously she can also take care of your tax return and stuff. So, so we've been working with Sandra, I think ever since you got started. So yes, yeah, exactly. That was fantastic. Uh, Catherine, my dear friend, Catherine, that that's been a while we've known together each other. So why yes. do you introduce yourself? Yeah, it's been a while now. We've been working together and then become friends. Um, well, I moved to France in 2002, and I have to say I was absolutely clueless. I had no idea how anything worked, especially things like the social security system and the, the SECU. The, the idea of different kiss for different insurance days, I just beyond me. So it was a very steep learning curve. And over the years, which has been over 20 years now, I have experienced just about everything that life in France can throw at you. And this kind of made me determined to share my knowledge and uh, mistakes with others, which is why in 2009, we started the Survive France community site, which is now the biggest um, and probably best go-to resource for English spe speakers in France. You can find an answer to just about everything on there from driving license applications to which breed of chickens you should buy. Um, and last year I started a podcast again, which is proving very popular. And the idea was to demystify all of the different things that go in France from how you go about installing a swimming pool to what happens at La Rentrée. And the podcast is Fra France Made Simple and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. So I hope I have something useful to contribute tonight. We shall see. Oh, you will always have. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and it's been a while. Uh, I remember first time we met was like 2015 or 16, early 16, I think. Yeah, wow. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's been, and, and and I can confirm that Survive Friends and, and now the podcast are both very busy, very active and vibrant community there. Um, it's, it's, it's a really nice source of information for wannabe expats or already expats that want to know the, the ways of France. Well, so we can start with you, Kat, uh, which, by, by the way, for the audience, there's a way we can call Catherine in France that Kat doesn't like, which is Katty. So please <laughs> refrain from calling her this way. <laughs> so, okay, now that I've made my joke, um, Kat, a lot of questions we got before uh, this session. So I'll, I'll be reading th through the questions and obviously you'll be sharing your advice. Um, a question that comes very often, uh, can you buy a property in France without a visa or a residency permit? Well, yes, but is my answer to that, because um, there's two things to consider here. The first is succession and estate planning, which will depend on whether or not you're a French tax resident. And I won't get into that here and now, but that's something to consider. But the other thing is way more practical. Um, if you are a non-resident without a visa, you're limited to the 90 days per, per 180 days in France or any EU country under EU rules. And if you want to stay longer, you're going to need a relevant long stay visa. So this 90 day rule is quite restrictive in terms of planning trips, managing your sheet. 
you know, you've got to think about things like what if there's a problem and you suddenly need to dash over and it's logistically impossible. I mean, there is a way around this in terms of if you can throw money at the problem in terms of having a management team in place, but that's not the ideal solution for everybody. So my answer to that would be, yes, you can, but I wouldn't advise it just from a practical point of view. Yeah, so basically what you're saying, uh, like, well, obviously, if you want to have a second home in France, obviously, like it's an extended holiday home, that's perfectly fine. But if you consider buying a property to be running some sort of activity, holiday lightings, obviously a JIT or whatever, it's a much more hazardous endeavor. Yeah, and also in the last couple of weeks, I've heard of three different uh, people who have decided to sell their French holiday homes because they're finding this 90 day rule too restrictive. And I've mm. also met people who are now going down the road of getting visas again because of this 90 day rule. So I think whilst it is technically doable, it's probably not a very sensible course of action without having a visa in place. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and I've been on um on the YouTube channel of a lovely US couple who uh, came up with a word that I like. They, they have created the Schengen Shuffle. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a good one. I like yeah. that, the Schengen Shuffle. So yeah, so that you have to work your way around these rules and being like 90, 90 days in the Schengen area and 90 days out of the Schengen area. So like, yeah. Uh, and yeah so, and but course, Warren and Julie, if, you, if you're there, yeah, that's you. Yeah, and of course, for anybody that needs to travel to other countries within the Schengen area, for maybe work or family or something like that, that's going to complicate things further. If you're only coming from the, you know, from, from the UK to France, then you it might be doable, complicated, but doable. But factor in trips to elsewhere. And I think really a visa is pretty much essential. Mm -hmm. And well, actually, because, uh, well, it's related question because we're talking about um, buying a property, but like the first step into buying it is to find the property. And in this particular context, um, I mean, is it is it possible? And if if so, how uh, do we find like a property but that has a JIT in it? Or could we like just buy a property and then get a JIT up and running, you know, from the ground up? Any I think I think it? there's I think there's two approaches here. Um one is you control uh, estate agent websites, of which there are many, to look for an already established JEET setup that's got a turnover. And often it's a JEET complex with, you know, one, two or three JEETs. The other thing is if you want to move and find something within a particular region, then you can go via word of mouth or looking at private ads, private sales or through estate agents. But I think you need to be quite careful about what you're buying um, and consider the area and consider is the market already saturated? I discovered the other day that the village uh, close to where I was staying, which has 102 houses, has 42 sheets. Seems like a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, and so you need to avoid areas as well where there's local housing regulations, because there is a kind of, I wouldn't quite say resentment, but in some areas where locals can't afford, you know, year round housing, measures are being put in place. place. There's a kind of anti Airbnb backlash mm. going on globally currently. So I think you need to be aware of that. I also think you need to look for a niche, uh, both in the area and the style of, co of accommodation where there's, a need that isn't currently being met um, and look for a USP. So maybe that's a water mill or something with lakes or something close to specific activities um, where you could offer something extra, like, I don't know, trail biking to Normandy beaches. Um, you know, you've got to look for a kind of unique setting, lakeside, tiny houses, cabins, all of those things are increasingly popular. Um, so I think, Yes, you can just buy a property and turn it into a jeep, but you need to think quite carefully about who is going to be staying there and the kind of people you're going to be marketing that property to and is it appropriate for them. Mm. Otherwise, you could end up with a bit of a white elephant. Okay, yeah. I like the saying. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, uh, another question that, that comes up often is the definition of a jeep because it's a word you see, well, everywhere but obviously it's a french one 
uh, we 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 brushed it um, at, at the beginning of this session, but maybe like also uh, what differentiates a JIT from an Airbnb from your perspective, like what would you say is the difference? I think the, although this is changing, actually, I spoke to a couple of sheet owners in the week and Airbnb used to be something that you could book for one night, two nights, three nights. Sheets tended to be for a week. Mm. That's now changing. Lots of sheet owners are providing the flexibility to just book for a night or two nights. Um, I suspect the biggest difference is that jeets tend to be more traditional french properties whereas airbnb are often located in more touristy areas um yeah. town centers you know people that want to go to a particular city for a, a night or two or maybe even longer uh whereas jeets traditionally have been more a kind of family holiday base but there is a big overlap these days no yeah no you're right and and, and on top of that like a jeet, well, as we we're saying, by the very definition of a jeet, uh, has to be independent. Uh, mm. So, could be attached to the house. By the way, I mean, I've, I've seen this question also a few times. Exactly. Uh, people think it has to be like an independent building. Uh, no, it, it just can't has be attached to, have... to the house, but it needs to have its independent entrance. Exactly, uh, independent uh, access and be yeah. self-contained. Whereas Airbnb can often be a room within somebody's exactly. house. Exactly which is much more like the chambre d'hôte model in France, where you mm. stay in a bedroom, maybe it's en suite, maybe it isn't, and you come down for breakfast in the host kitchen in the morning, which is the Airbnb room at, in your host's house option, if you like, whereas a, a gîte is always self-contained. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so, well, we well, we just mentioned the uh, the big player like Airbnb, but basically well these jeets are, are also kind kind of something a bit specific so so to, would you know like how actually do you be listed how can you call yourself a jeet and and okay, therefore well, how do you promote it yeah. the big big player in the industry is jeet de france um, and that is what the majority are listed and accredited with and you will be given a star rating from 1 to 5 and it's very, very specific. Um, again, I met somebody the other day who had been lost a star from the year before because the regulations had changed and they hadn't provided a waffle maker. <laughs> oh, really? A, a waffle maker, seriously. Um, so you start with a kind of basic level of equipment, uh, which I did actually research earlier. And then five stars is you've got to have, you know, uh, and a house on its own in a beautiful setup with a garden and either a swimming pool, a plunge pool, a sauna, jacuzzi, something like that. So, you know, Gite de France is the main listing site for people who want to get their stars. Now, tourist offices also provide listings and some of them have their own star rating system. Mm. which has got, again, you will need to be inspected by the local tourist office. And it does vary massively from department to department and even from commune to commune as to whether your sheep will be considered two star, three star or four star. But do they, so the, these labels in a way, like do they, do they help the sheep business in itself? Like, is it some sort of a promotion you get? I think free, they or? do. They yeah. do definitely, because once you've got your, star rating you're then free to list your property on numerous sites such as the annuaire de gîte en france or gîtelink.com or gîtes.co.uk and if you can add a star rating and the gîte de france badge that gives people who are booking some kind of level of security and reassurance that they're booking a product that has a certain level of comfort and facilities and has been inspected so i would say that these days it is definitely worth getting a rating mm. um yeah, and, and well, technically speaking, you'd have a free promotion by the very definition that you listed also on those websites. And therefore, 
Well, although I, would, those... I wouldn't expect much out of that, but yeah. No, some of those websites are paid for and the prices vary according, you know, quite widely from sort of 40 euros a year to over 200 euros a year. So again, if you want to be listed outside of the tourist office or Gite de France, I would really recommend doing your due diligence and looking at the website stats and seeing mm. how many people are actually booking through them. I mean, some of them offer quite good money back guarantees. If you don't get like, for example, five serious inquiries, okay. they'll refund your year's subscription. Um, but it's always worth chatting to other GIT owners to see where they're listing their properties mm. and what's working for them. Because it, obviously you've got, you know, Maison Vacances, Airbnb, Booking.com, HomeAway, even Le Bon Coin. Um, but again, it depends on the type of property you've got. You don't generally list a chateau that's suitable for wedding receptions and massive family events on Le Bon Coin. Um, you yeah, might uh, list a kind of more basic house that's suitable for a large family to go on holiday. So it's know your product and know your market. But that, but that's that, but that, this one is a good tip because it definitely is French specific. Uh, um, so I think I think Le Bon Coin would be the equivalent of Craigslist in 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 the US and like Gumtree probably in the UK yeah, or something like exactly. that. So so it's a French specific website uh, where and then if you if you advertise on this, actually you can advertise for free, but you can also promote it, but you can be listed for free. Uh, well, then you therefore you'd get. French clients through this website, but that's a way for free to advertise. This is a good way, actually, I think. Uh, well, for most businesses, uh, but also booking.com, like you've mentioned, you know, like the, or Airbnb. These guys also are a way to to advertise for uh, the JIT business. It's not incompatible. Like you could have the label like JIT de France, exactly. but also be on those platforms. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's great. And, and, Obviously, because we 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 don't have infinite pockets. So so what what are usually the kind of expenses we need to consider when running a GIT or you know? Like... Oh, that's <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Actually, I think well, first of all, proper insurance because a GIT is somewhere where you're receiving the public, and you do not want somebody falling down the stairs and claiming that it's mandatory yeah. anyway. So like yeah, you have to have public liability for it. Yeah, it's mandatory, but, you know, make sure you've got uh, adequate insurance cover in terms of breakages as well and damage that people might cause, that kind of thing. I think also you've got to consider the utility bills, especially in the winter where, you know, everybody's different. Personally, I hate being cold. And if I go to stay somewhere in the winter, I will put the heating on full blast and I will run the towel radiator in the bathroom. Um, and I see a mm. lot of comments online from jeet owners complaining about the costs of running and heating their jeets in the winter. But I think you've got to have flexible expectations. And especially if you're welcoming guests from around the world, for example, you know, in the winter months, you get a lot of people from Asia traveling to France, uh, especially to visit things like the Mont Saint-Michel. It's cold there in the winter in Normandy, Brittany they're going to want to be warm. Mm. So you've got to be re realistic and look at the average cost throughout the year. And the same goes for the workload. You know, some people uh, periods are really hardcore and you might be doing three changeovers in a day or a week or whatever, depending on the number of properties you have. Other periods are quieter. Um, the other expenses are cleaning fees in terms of, you know, the sort of time cost benefit to yourself you know is it worth subcontracting stuff like the laundry linen ironing that kind of thing um and you know everybody's got different expectations in terms of cleanliness and how much work they want to take on and how they want to do so I think you've got to be realistic and one of the best ways seems to be to charge a relatively low cleaning fee, but make it clear mm. that you expect it to be left as yeah. As I, they I found think that it. this is this is very often the case. Like like it was charging for a small cleaning fee, yeah, on top of yeah, and that's really something doing. again. You know, Airbnb cleaning fees have become really exorbitant in the last few years, and that's something people are increasingly aware of. Um, I think, you know, things like replacing linen, it's a cost swallow it up it's costly but necessary because nobody wants to go and stay and sleep in a bed where the bedding is slightly dubious and look, looks a bit aged you know ikea is great for cheap and cheerful 
replace it as soon as you if you think you need to replace it you probably should have already replaced it Mm. you know things have got to be pristine and squeaky clean these days people people expect that um you know 30 40 years ago when I first came to France on holiday with my parents and we stayed in sheets you know there was one year where the gas cooker exploded and blew the window out and we just thought it was quite fun yeah 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 my dad lost his eyebrows um we thought it was quite funny these days people would sue you and claim the cost of their holiday and say their holiday was ruined because they hadn't been able to reheat their whatever. Oh. So, you know, standards have changed a lot. Um, they've got a lot higher. And I think, although that might seem like an expense in terms of keeping everything absolutely sort of brand new, um, it's just something that you've got to factor into your budget. Okay, well, I wasn't aware of that anecdote with the eyebrow, your, your dad's eyebrow. <laughs> This sounds scary. Okay, well, well, um, uh, just uh, guys, France is safe now. Uh, it's no longer the nineties. <laughs> so. I think that was probably the seven, the seventies actually. <laughs> but, okay, uh, okay. A long time ago, and Good. I think also it's not an expense, but I think you have to consider the mental cost of running a jeet because it is quite taxing, and I think the. The way to overcome this is don't dwell on bad experiences because it will happen and it will happen again and you have to accept it. But the majority of your guests are going to be lovely and the majority of your experiences are going to be great. Mm. So if hospitality is your thing and running a sheet is your thing, then I would say go for it. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, it's a good advice because, yeah, I would also put it like the other way around. Like if it's not your thing, just don't force it you into doing that like you know that sometimes you have to have realistic expectations as well but if you think like you're you're a people's person or a person people you no know, people person yeah people person yeah well then you can go for it for it um i've seen um i think it's time for some of the live questions i've seen quite a few questions around kind of taxes or businesses uh i'll read some of them because uh i think they're mostly for sandra however some of your questions I know are part of my question list for Sandra already, but I'll read them anyway. Like Kate was asking, what is the best business setup for a JIT? Um, I'm French resident already with a micro enterprise, I suppose, uh, but partner does not have one. So um, so Sandra, basically, uh, Kate, Kate is a micro enterprise, a French resident, but partner is not registered. But I suppose then they want to run a JIT together. Uh, um, in fact, uh, it was it one of your questions, yes, but uh, if you exercise a furnished rental activity, you have to register your activity to the guichet unique in France to obtain a CRET number. So that means it's like an ID number for your activity. This number will be needed to fulfill all your obligation to the tax authorities, like your income tax return, VIT returns, if you decide to opt for VIT. So that means if she, he's not a tax resident, he can do um, run the JIT with Kate, but he has to register because he, he's in micro-entreprise and micro-entreprise is for one person only. Oh, okay. so uh, both uh, of can, them has to register. Can we still be, uh, is there still the thing like conjoint collaborateur, like the working spouse or something? Does that still apply yes, or... you have something like that but he, he's not run a jeet it's like right. he, he works with his with kate so he, so they should both a... be registered then no he he doesn't have to register okay, okay. He's not a collaborator. he doesn't have to register but maybe he has to register to social security in france because conjoint collaborator is a specific regime in france mm. so that means he has to register to pay income tax in france because he has to pay taxes income tax and social security like an employee or non-working salar salary it depends the status so technically kate is doing right because she's already registered as a micro enterprise Yes, whether the, the partner, depending on whatever is a tax resident or not, uh, so might be a conjoint collaborateur. So basically you can piggyback onto her micro enterprise, but then she needs to amend something like change our uh, declaration if it's not already declared. Okay. Or can the partner also be uh, registering a business on its own, like an other, if it's the same sheet or, yeah. Yes, he can do. He can okay. do that. He can register, and if we, if he was a split, so 50 fifty-fifty <laughs> for okay. the income tax or all the. But but basically, so um, 
So it's either it becomes a conjoint collaborateur, so a working spouse or partner through yes. the partner's micro-entreprise, or he, he also he registers a business on himself. Yes. Okay. He but he, this that. might have some tax implications and residency implications, so yeah. Of course. Okay. Of course. Renegit so, is always have a tax implication, so it's very important to, to be sure. <laughs> actually, uh, th th there's a question. So, well, I, I, some of the questions are ahead of what I'll be asking, but that, that, that's great. Uh, Eric is asking, we intend... So we intend obtaining a long stay visa. So would it be wise for us to consider buying a property um, for us? So a residential property and a second separate residence for the JIT. Would this be considered favorably by authorities making decision on financial security? So I think it is, is in regard to the visa. Uh, we are here in France at the minute in Normandy and are starting the research. Oh, okay, well, th th this one is more about visas. Uh, actually, it doesn't really make, I mean, whatever you have a property or not doesn't really impact how favorable that, that the decision. However, uh, we've rarely seen visa rejections, uh, visa, visa applications being rejected for property owners in France. Um, because, like, yeah, it shows commitment in a way, so I think they like it. So, so I would say, well, what do you think, Sandra? Uh, would that make a difference or...? Um, I think, um, in my opinion, I'm not a specialist in immigration, but um, if he has a visitor visa, it depends if he wants to run a JIT, because like I said before, you have to register your activity. So that means if you plan to operate your JIT as real business, you might need a specific visa like business visa, a talent, a talent passport entre or entrepreneur visa. So if you have like... Um, a visitor visa, maybe it can be a problem to really run a JIT. For the it's audience, the, the, the visitor visa is the non-working visa in France, which is by far and large the most popular option, especially for retirees, because a lot of retirees are considering the JIT activity to like kind of top up the income or something. So, But we'll get into this one because uh, there are some, obviously it's France, so there are some exemptions. So, so like if you're running a very small JIT business, it could not be seen as a business if there's a low, very low turnover and, you know, actually not filing this as a JIT, but like LMNP kind of stuff. But, I mean, we'll get into these. We'll get into these questions. Um, okay. Um, so Ber Bernard uh, is... Uh, is it Bernard? Uh, Catherine? Bernard is Bernard in English? or Bernard? Yeah. Bernard. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I sorry for the night. Sorry for the pronunciation, Bernard. Uh, if you have a bed and breakfast on, on a vine in estate, are you still limited to five rooms and 15 guests? If the bed and breakfast section is a separate independent building to the main residence, yes. Actually, that, that's the definition of uh, it's supposed to be independent, whatever it's attached or detached building. Doesn't make a difference. So the limits, that's how the limitation is in rooms and guests because technically this is the limit, yeah. Although, although, obviously, there's always a catch potentially. Like if these, because sometimes if you have a big plot of land, and if these are in different addresses, these might be seen as different businesses. So sometimes, you know, it might be seen as various businesses. But then also, it depends on how you registered. If you find that as an individual, that doesn't work. So it has to be a business anyway. So it's always a bit specific. You know, so so uh, I'm told it is treated as a separate enterprise. Enterprise, okay. Oh yeah, okay. I was in reference to. Oh yeah, uh, no, no. Whoever told you that is 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 wrong. No. Uh, well, you'd have to register a, a business. I think Sandra. Sorry. Yes, you have to register a business in the guichet unique. Like I said before, it's just you have an ID number for your activity. That's like a tax it. code. Yeah. Mm. I could. Yes, it's it's all uh, normally it's just for the tax authorities. Like I said, to to file uh, your in income tax return, but it's not like you r really register a business. Like I don't know, you're a lawyer or something like that. That's no, it's it's, it's similar to what they would call self-employed. I think usually it's just yes. that in France, self-employed are registered. Like they they consider the business, but it's very light to form a business. So like yeah, uh, and and for the audience, by the way, uh, uh, Sandra keeps on referring on the guichet unique. Uh, don't, well, you know that. 
we're French. We like to we like acronyms. We like fancy words. So, but the Guichet Unique is just like a, a common website where like you, you do everything from this portal. It's like see that as a portal. It's like you impo.gov.fr, like you can do all of tax related stuff from this place, for example. And, you know, like we have to, we like this. In fact, the Guichet Unique is just the, the portal to register your activity. And after that, um, you will receive like a memo, memento of the tax administration and also from yourself if you are submitted to yourself. So that means just the portal to register. That's it. Yeah. And after that, you will have to create your um impo.gouv.fr space, also your ERSAF space if you are submitted to social security contributions. But the first step to be to be short, it's to register at the Guichet Unique. Like it's very, very, um, very easy to register at the Guichet Unique. It's not complicated. You just have to, to put the right tax and corporate options, but it's easy. It's, yeah, well, it's it's easy, but like it's it's as simple as Frenchly possible. Let's say. Yes, of course. Yes, <laughs> so, it's only in French. So if you so don't it, speak French, it, it can be still French yeah. for you. <laughs> can I just jump in here and say to anybody who's listening and heard things like EarthSaf and Goof.fr and as thinking to themselves, what the hell is the EarthSaf? I have a podcast episode out, which you can find, and it's called The Guide to Acronyms, where we explain what all these things like the CPAM and the AMELI and the ERSAF are. So if anybody's struggling with French government bodies and acronyms, go and have a listen to that and uh, you should get a bit more of an idea. Yeah, well, we, we do love our acronyms, don't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, uh, Randy was asking, bonjour, uh, bonjour, if you're not a taxable resident in France, staying under 183 days, uh, that's not the only criteria, but okay, uh, but rent your French residence with the, or oh, will, well, will the income from, uh, will the income from the rental be taxed? I think Sandra, I think I have yes. the answer. If, but you a non -French, if you are a non-French tax resident, you will be um, only taxed on your French revenues. So that means if you received uh, French revenues of your properties or rental, uh, you have to declare them in your French tax return. So you have to make a French tax return and to declare them. Yeah. Yeah, and well, if you, if you signed a tax treaty with the other country, normally you will receive a tax credit in this other country. Because they are only taxable. In yeah. Oh, yeah. That. That. Yeah. So for most of you guys uh, coming from the US, UK, uh, uh, basically countries where, where uh, which uh, with which uh, France has tax treaties, uh, you would never have to pay twice. That's basically what Sandra is saying. But also, uh, and I think it's pretty much all across the planet, when there is income that's tied to a property, uh, it's always taxed in the country it's it's in. So like if you have properties in the US, you pay property taxes in the US. If you have properties in the UK, property taxes in the UK, same and same for France. So if you have some sort of an activity in France and it generates income, uh, yeah. Um, okay, well, this one, uh, uh, well, Sandra, John's asking, is there a difference in tax to pay between a gîte, a chambre d'hôte and a hotel? Yes, it's not the same. Uh, in fact, it's the same tax rate, but um, it's just for, like like um, like you said before, we have a lot of um, type of enterprise in France and company. You have micro entreprise, individual entreprise, and also companies subject to income tax and companies subject to a corporate tax. So in fact, uh, it will be very important uh, to determine if you can benefit from micro uh, enterprise because micro enterprise you have like um, you cannot exceed a certain amount of turnover so for example chambre d'hôte you have a turnover very high so i think it's 188 k euros per year and you can have an automatic abatement uh, deduction of um, 50 percent i think mm. i'm not sure it's 50 or 71 uh, but in fact, uh, it's really important to know uh, if you are in a JIT, if you are if in a classified JIT, in a non-classified JIT, if you exercise as 
professional, non-professional, if you're a chambre d'hôte, you have, it's just for the micro-entreprise, but for the tax and rate the kind of, and social sorry, The kind of scheme, because the, 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 the scheme, like if you are, I, I think, because to answer the question, I, as you were saying, like the, 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 the regime micro, which is French specific, I think that, that the audience doesn't understand that because obviously it's French specific. You cannot offset business expenditures as a micro entreprise. So like every business expenses, that's why uh, Sandra was saying, you have an automatic deduction uh, to cope for these expenses. If you want, if you think you, you need more deduction, then maybe in your case, it's more relevant to be something like a French LTD or, uh, or LLC. But that, that's why, I mean, that's kind of Sandra's job. I was yes, like, depending course. on what you'd be doing, uh, it depends. It really depends. So, so, um, and I'm not commissioned by Sa by Sandra, by the way. Just, just, <laughs> so, uh, uh, although we're both wearing red, I've just seen that as well. But uh, <laughs> probably because we're French, or I don't know. maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I'll kind of answer each the question because it always kind of depends on the situation. Indeed, uh, but it, it's also usually you should look at uh, business expenditures. That's a main a key factor to determine whatever you should be. Uh, oh, wow, new bubbles. Okay, so yeah, to determine whatever you should indeed be like incorporated as an LLC or LTD or as a micro. Usually, guys, the micro entreprise, everyone does it because it's so convenient. It's it's super simple. You don't need an accountant and stuff. That's why it's so popular. But for some people, um, uh, yeah, it depends what you what you've done or what you want to be doing. Some people investing into the property through an SCI sometimes might be more relevant to be a former business. It depends. So yeah, N not for an SCI if you want. Uh, it's not my recommendation. An SCI is like for um, non furnished rental. It's better. No, no, but that, that's what I'm saying. Some people who have bought into this, so so, so that's why we have so many different schemes and types of businesses. We have a lot of schemes in yeah. France. Uh, so actually, yeah, uh, Nicola is kind of bouncing on that. Like what happens with tax when you earn over 15,000? Do you need to be registered as regime real? Uh, yeah, uh, regime real, as we said, like like uh, to, to the real expenses, basically, you, you're, you're making. So Sandra, maybe, uh, did, did you get the question or? It said 15. Yeah, 15,000, one five, yeah. Yes, one five. Uh, in fact, he has right because... Um... In fact, for the micro, um, micro enter, enter, enterprise, micro enterprise, like I said before, um, it's important to know if you are a classified JIT, a non-classified JIT. If you are a non-classified JIT, um, you cannot exceed 15 K euros of turnover and you have only 30% of an automatic deduction. So that means if you exceed 15 K euros, you have to be Entreprise individual, so individual enterprise or a company subject to income tax or corporate tax. It depends on your situation. So yes, but if you are a non, if you are a classified JIT, the turnover is not the same for now. It's 188k oh. euros. But be careful because we have maybe a, a change of flow uh, to to make 77k euros. It will mm. be. Less. Which is still generous, okay, yeah. It's still generous, and you have an automatic abatement of 17, 71%, and maybe the, the, the low we will change to 50, but it will be generous too, but it depends. How, how much is, uh, because, yeah, I think also for, for that to make sense for the audience, and sorry, guys, if we bombard you with numbers and, and percentages, I know it's, uh, we're trying to make it sexy, though, we're trying very hard, <laughs> uh, but the, the um, when we mentioned the, these uh, deductions and, you know, uh, um, everyone wants the, the micro-entreprise uh, studies because there is a very, very low um, social tax on this. And, and basically, guys, you know, France has very bad reputation when it comes to taxes. Uh, actually, it's, you know, Bernard Arnault is French, lives in Paris, is one of the wealthiest guys in the, in the, on the planet. So France is not that bad in regard to taxes. We have the bad reputation that's mostly in regard to social taxes, but mostly in regard to social taxes on wages. So on businesses, might still be okay, although it would be more expensive and more important than what you used to from like the US, UK, et cetera, except for micro-entreprise. That's why everyone wants this, because 
I don't know, what, what's the rate for a micro entreprise on average? 20, 21% of the turnover. And you have to declare monthly. After deduction. No, in fact, for micro entreprise, you can opt for micro social. Okay. Uh, micro social. So that means you have to declare monthly or quarterly your turnover. And you have 20% approximately, depends, but it's 20% of uh, taxes, social security contributions. Yeah. So, it depends really really you have to make some calculation to know what is the best structure for you but usually that's favorable because that's that's i mean in france that's very cheap like it's only 20 percent then and in in entreprise individual so individual enterprise um it's for the net result and you have like the the social security contribution is about 20 Twenty percent to thirty-five percent. It depends uh, your your retirement uh, pension. These type of things. But but on the entreprise individual, I think they can offset business expenditures then. Or yes, that's okay. it. It's why it's a net result. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. the turnover. It's a net result. So that means um, that means uh, the turnover, so the rent collected and charges minus all the expenses. Yeah, that's very and also on top of that, like um, well. Just, just so you, like for example, myself, uh, if I want to pay myself, well, it's under the, the minimum wage, but like for, for run numbers, if I want to pay myself a thousand euros net, basically as a business, I would have to pay 2000 euros total because I'll have like almost 100% social charges. So when we say in France, like as a micro entreprise, you, on, you only pay 20%. Yes. It's a massive deduction compared to what I would have to pay in social charges for my employees and stuff. So that's, that's why from a French perspective, everyone is trying to get this rate because it's so favorable in France. And also obviously gives you the benefits of paying for, for social charges because then you'd get French national healthcare, which we call the CPIM or La Secu, as Catherine was saying. You'd get those benefits also as part of the package, therefore, because you're paying for it. So, And also retirement pension, if you have like some some... A, a, a large duration of uh, cotization in French, but you can have yeah. Um, if you move uh, the early, yeah, yeah. And obviously, you'd have the rights to protest and riot. It's part of the package as well. So <laughs> yeah. we we don't extend that to those who are not paying into social charges because it has to be you know <laughs> you has to contribute to riot. No, okay. Well, that's a joke, obviously. Um, so do we need? So Jen's asking, do we need to be French taxpayers to run a sheet? Uh, we plan to get a long-term visa as retirees, but want to run a GT in the summer. Sandra, <laughs> uh, do you have? Do you need to have to be a French tax resident? That is do the you question. Need to, well, yeah, French taxpayers, a French tax resident to run a GT. Yeah. Uh, to run a GT, you don't need to be a French tax resident because tax residency depends on um, several criteria. So that means if you checked one of criteria, you can be. Um, tax resident like personal criteria you have your tax household or your long stay in France you have an economic criteria if you have your main investment in France or an economy uh, professional criteria if you exercise uh, an activity in France so your main principal activity is in France uh, but you can be you can be uh, not a French tax resident and rent a gîte um, but that's just you have to file the French tax return for the revenues you have in for the French um, property. And obviously the and the one eighty three days uh, kind of well yes, known yes. rule. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, this one, Catherine, might be uh, kind of for you because uh, in a way you've done it yourself. Like David's asking, are there any incentives from local or central government to take old unused rural properties? And do them up to both live in and use as a JIT business or like as any kind of business for, for that matter. Oh, Catherine, you're off. You, you, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm mute. Right. I've unmuted. Yes, there are. And it's a yes and no question because they, the, okay, there's a, a nationwide site, nationwide site called Map. Prime, P R I M E Renov, and I haven't looked for this year because it does change for year on year. But they will give you grants to renovate properties, especially in terms of thermal efficiency. Mm. Um, so things like double glazing, new heating systems, 
all that kind of thing. Now, there's no criteria on there as far as I know that it needs to be your main residence. It can be a GIT as well, and it, you can even apply as a so tenant. It's not GIT specific, property. that's what you're saying. No, it's not GIT specific, I think, as far as I know, but the, the regulations do change all the time. So anybody that's interested in right, going down cool. that road would need to have a close look. For example, we um, got quite a lot of grants through two years ago, and that included new windows and doors. They're no longer reimbursed at the following year. They were no longer reimbursed at the same rate. And I think they're not reimbursed at all now. And you do need to make sure that what they call beautifully in French, the, the bouquet, which I like, the kind of the gathering together of all the elements equates to a certain percentage of improved thermal efficiency. Then there are also different regional grants um, in different regions and there are always kind of uh, criteria that apply for example with the Maprim Renov grants I think you have to commit not to sell your property for five or seven years after you receive the money um, certain regions have policies in place for the improvement of rental accommodation uh, which would include jeets so you would have to do your research in your local area but mm. basically yes there are funds out there for the improvement and renovation of dilapidated old properties. You just need to hunt them out and make sure that you tick all the boxes, complete all the paperwork correctly, and you will eventually get quite a decent chunk of money back. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Well, okay. So uh, we, we'll, um, we'll catch up on the questions. Uh, just uh, I want to make sure we have time for, for uh, Sandra to answer what was what were the critical questions that I really want to address on these uh, on today's session? So uh, we'll get up, get back to your live questions uh, in a bit. Uh, thanks, Kat, by the way, for answering. And um, one one question that, that 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 pops up very very often is: Do I need like mandatory? Do I need to be registered as a business to rent a sheet or any sort of property rental, or can I file that under my uh, national taxes? Uh, you're on mute as well, Sandra. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. In fact, you can run um, a JIT as a business or as individual. You can have both. But in any case, like I said before, you have to register your activity at the Gishinik. It's the only obligation. But you can be a business, like a company, but also like an individual. Even if it's in France, it's complicated because as an individual, we are like individual entreprise or micro entreprise, but it's like individual. But that's so not it, the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, so confusing. Same. It's not a company. We have company, like re really company with shareholders and we have like individuals and it's a big difference. Yeah, well, yeah, to try to demystify this. So basically, and properties are one of these things where it's very pe peculiar. You could be a person, like an individual person. You just have, like a business number, but uh, to file that JIT activity or that revenue, but you're a person and you're filing this as a person, or you could be an incorporated person. So like a, the business version of yourself. So, well, technically you would see that that's what you would call self-employed then, I think. Or you could be a formal registered business, like an LLC or LTD, uh, and all would apply. So you, you can, oh, well, there are some limits and, you know, then some are more tax efficient than others and stuff. But yeah, basically, they're all on the table. Uh, but if, you, like if you're doing 200,000 turnover, you have to be a business, for example. So then there are some limitations. But yeah. OK, well, that, but basically, the answer is if they're running a very small activity, potentially they can even file this on their national taxes as, as, as a person. They have to register on the guichet unique. But yeah. Of course, yes. Uh, if you are like micro entreprise or individual entrepre entrepre entreprise, uh, you just have to file your uh, French tax return, your individual French tax return. You have to indicate the net uh, the net result for individual entreprise and your turnover in micro entreprise. That's it. And for individual entreprise, you need to make like um, another tax return. But I recommend to have an accountant to do that. Yeah, but definitely. Yeah. Especially considering that depending on how much turnover, as we mentioned, yes. like whatever you find this as a person or as a business, like if you do less or more than 15,000, because that's kind of a low thre threshold, yes. then you, you need to declare things differently as well. So yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah. 
because well you, you can climb some expenses like innovation work and stuff but like if you're doing less than fifteen thousand and you have opted for the uh, regime micro simplifier i think it's the name or that's it and it's then it. you can't it, it's all no. it's automated deduction so yeah Yes, you have you have to see what is the amount of your expenses, so for your for forex expenses, and also you have like some specificities. In France, we have like something called um, depreciation for the value of the property, so it can be um, good oh, included. To okay, included. Yeah. Yes, it can be included on the on the on the expenses. It's not a real expense. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. Something theoretical. Oh, but... okay. Now what you're saying is basically well. The number would be off, but just so to, to dumb it down, like you're buying a hundred thousand euros property, basically you can offset. Well, let's say the numbers would be off again, but like you can offset like ten thousand euros from your turnover as the, the depreciation of your property. Yes, yes, in fact, because like you, can... you would consider the initial investments, and then you, we can offset part of this. Yes, in individual entreprise or a company, you can, if you are an individual entrepreneur. Okay, so, so that's LMP, worth having a look. LMP. It's very important because um, you have like. For example, you, basically you take around 70% of the value of the, the property because you said 30% is um, just the soil and it's not uh, the- Yeah, the walls, the not the walls. Yes. And um, you divide by a certain number of, number of years, it depends between 15 and 50, and you have an annual amount to deduct. So mm. in the majority of the case, individual enterprise can be better than micro entreprise. Okay. Okay. Good. Good to know. I love that. <laughs> As we are in, in, in the sexy stuff uh, and the acronyms and, and all of that, uh, there's another acronym. It's very popular in France, especially in, in the rental industry uh, and JITS, uh, which is called LMNP. So, Loueur Meublé Non Professionnel. Uh, so, I've seen things like, you know, there's a 23,000 euros allowance. And it's, well, but maybe can, can you elaborate? I mean, tax wise, what, what is this? Like, yeah. So LMNP status is non-professional furnished rental. So you have non-professional. Contrary to LMP, it's professional. So that could um, be for a JIT. Yes, it could be. You can build LMNP or LMP for a JIT. It's not a problem. It's not for it's you. You not will be exclusive. LMNP okay, that could be yes, inclusive. Not, um, so normally, the LMNP um, to qualify for LMNP status you must meet at least one of the following two conditions. So that means you and your spouse partner, if you have one, has rental revenues of this activity of less than 23 euros per year. And the second condition, it's not exclusive. So if you met at least one of the condition, you will be an element P. And the second condition is your rental income representing less than 50% of the active income of your tax. Oh, so, so the that's household, okay. Salary, non-salaried, retirement pension. It's very important because this income oh, yes. has to be subject to income tax. So that means, for example, if you are, um, if you have salaried or non-salaried income slowly for foreign sources, and you have more than 23 euros, you will be automatically considered as a professional. So very important. Or if you just have this source of income as income, then you would be seen as a professional. If you have this source of income, no, if your um, your revenue are less than 23 euros, it's not the two conditions. Ah, it's two either. Conditions. Okay, it's either. Okay. It's either. It's either or yes, you can have both <laughs> to be element. Okay, okay. But also, if... you could be making more than 23,000, but if you're making more yes, if... income as other sources. Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, that's nice. You, you meet at least one of these conditions. Okay. And if you have the two conditions, so that means you have more than 23 euros and your rental income uh, representing less than 50% of the active income, you will be automatically a prof professional furnished rental, so LMP. But you have to meet the two conditions to be LMP. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, no, I, I get it. Okay. Because uh, um, I mean, oh, well, we're talking about taxes, but this, uh, th that's why this was a question I wanted to ask you because this is this has very, very impo uh, important implications for, for you guys that are listening and, and potentially considering a visa or, or, or residency permit in France because like the NP bit of the acronym stands for non-professional, as we've said, and therefore some of you might be considering a non-working visa, for example, so a visitor visa, 
And then if you're having some sort of rental income that could qualify as LMNP, then, then you could actually have a non-working visa and run that activity that wouldn't be exclusive then. <laughs> okay, well, it's a party now. Um, so yeah, well, actually it's a party. It's, it's a great, yeah, it's a great thing because then you can have a non-working visa, but still be making income basically in France. That's what we're saying. That's why it's so important. So although these, all these acronyms are boring, they do have some deep implications. So, uh, it's actually great, but uh, okay, nice, nice stuff. I wasn't aware of that, the 50% bit. It's very nice because then you have two options. Okay. Yes. Um, um yeah so so um the the other questions i have we've covered it about you know the, the type you know like micro entreprise or entreprise individuel or the french ltd uh uh okay but but actually actually i think just to to illustrate because like all of that is kind of theoretical i don't know a good euro with math but c can you can you work out a, a bit of an example, like, I don't know, so, someone doing, I, I know we, we talked about this before, guys, so that, that's why she, she probably would be cheating a bit, but uh, someone doing like 70,000 uh, turnover as a shit business, what would be the difference if they are like, I don't know, a micro entreprise or, or uh, an LTD, which in France is called SIRL or could be an SIS, you know, we have different forms. Well, basically, what, what would be the difference? Uh, can you give us some examples? Like, you know, for example, um, if you are in micro entreprise and you are a classified JIT, JIT. so like Kat, Kat said before, um, you have to uh, be uh, in touristic. You you have to be um, classified to the French touristic authority. You cannot be classified like you want. It's really you have to make a process. But that, that that's what Kat, Kat was saying earlier. That's one of the benefits as well of being. Listed. Yes, it's yeah. one of the benefits because you have the highest uh, amount. Um, you have uh, an automatic deduction of 71% of at present. Like I said before, this, this could rise to 50% if you have the lowest past. Uh, so that means your net, the, the amount after the deductions will be 20 euros approximately. And it will be subject to progressive income tax, so scale bracket, and social security contributions. If you have, let's say, an income tax at a rate of 30%, an average personal tax rate of 30%, you will pay income tax of 6K euros and social security also 6K euros. So that means you have to pay 12K euros for a 70K euros of, um, of turnover. turnover. Oh. Okay. So it, it will be okay for me. It, as a yeah, friend, it's not, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, it's not that bad. That's not bad. Um, if you are an individual enterprise, you have 50% of expenses. And like I said before, you have also the depreciation. So in my example, let's say you have an asset worth, worth 400k euros. You have a depreciation of around 14k euros for the first year. So that means you have your um, your um, your turnover, 70k euros, expensive, 30, um, 35k euros, and the depreciation are approximately 14k euros. So your net result will be also 20k euros, approximately. So you have the same result in micro entreprise and in individual entreprise. Um, so for me, like I said before, it's very important to know if you have a classified JIT or non-classified JIT, but the micro entreprise, it's not always the best solution. Uh, if you buy um, a JIT uh, and you have a lot of expenses and with the depreciation, you can be under the, the net result of a micro entreprise. So you, in our example, it's the same result. But and depending it, on how much business expenditures we, I mean, yes. like Kat was saying, like if you hire subcontractors, it's probably going to be higher than the figures you, you've said. So, yeah. So that's it. so it's very important. Also, if you like I said, your JIT is classified, non-classified. If you're a professional, non-professional, all these elements will be very important. Mm. And if you are a company, so subject to corporate tax, we don't spoke about the corporate tax, but the corporate tax in in is friend in France is um, fifteen percent for the fraction under forty two k euros under certain circumstances, and twenty five percent for the fraction uh, over. So that means in our case, 
the net result will be the same as individual entreprise because you can have you have the same expenses and you can also have the depreciation so you will have 50, uh, 20k euros of net result but you have a corporate tax of 3k euros so it will be better and you don't have any social security contributions uh, for a for a company subject to corporate tax but it's very important to understand that in the company the cash belongs to the company so you cannot take the money of the company without distributing dividends or pay a remuneration so if you distribute some dividends or a remuneration you will have some personal income tax and also some social security contributions for you it's different because in micro entreprise or individual entreprise you can have the the cash because you, like we said before it's a little bit complicated but you are individual so it's you so you can have the cash but yeah, it's in prepaid company, in a way you yes, prepaid you don't the have taxes two separate entity uh, but a company it's a real entity it's a legal entity so you cannot have the cash so in our example well, you can but but it will, it will be taxed. you have to distribute yeah. yeah you cannot just take the, take the cash out the the bank bank account and say it's okay so in our example you paid 3k euros let's say you have you want to distribute dividends for 70k euros you have to pay 5k euros of income tax and social security contribution so it's very important to understand uh, what is your plan your objectives uh, what is your turnover forecast uh, if you want to exercise as professional, non-professional, and, and business expenditures, and business expenditures as well, yeah. yes, and to make some simulation to know what is the best structure and the best case for you. But just to make sure we don't all have a headache here, so that, that's your job, isn't it? Yes, it's my job. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that's <laughs> what I want to do here. Simulation and explain you. I will make some uh, some numbers. It's one of my job to know the best structure for you uh, to exercise, like uh, to, to to exercise as a JIT owner in France. Okay, no, but that's yeah. Well, I mean, she, she definitely. Um, I know that my my, I wouldn't say my accountant is my best friend, but I mean, every time it comes to these kind of decisions, I'm like, it's kind of a one-off piece of advice so uh once you know i mean and, and vice versa like if you've done if you made the right decision the wrong decision uh you, you're going to regret it maybe you won't even be aware of it but then you may end up paying too much taxes or too much social charges and may may have been able to avoid at least a fraction of those so yeah it's kind of that, that's why the french are so um so keen on seeking advice for, for that kind of stuff you know tax lawyers are accountants you know it's a and technically personally i prefer tax lawyers not because sandra is here but because the accountant is the one who will get the job done so it's in their interest to kind of create the scheme that's the most favorable in terms of their rate whereas sandra is not an accountant so she'd give you her advice tax wise she doesn't care whatever you do than a, a micro entreprise or an LTD or whatever. She, she doesn't get more money if you get an LTD rather than a micro entreprise, which wouldn't be the case with an accountant. Not that I don't like accountants. It's just that's why for me, when it comes to the initial advice, I tend to favor um, tax lawyers uh, and therefore Sandra, obviously, here. So, um, okay. So, uh, we 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 passed an hour, but uh, I see like there's only like Nani has been busy, so there's only five questions left. We'll try to um, uh, see if we can answer a few. Uh, if you still have for this, and then we'll call it a wrap. <laughs> so uh, if we purchase a working sheet, would we would we immediately be registered for tax and social security? It depends if you exercise as professional or non-professional. Uh, because if you are non-professional and under 23k uh, euros of um, turnover, so you have to make both, you don't have to pay social security contributions on uh, active income. So you don't have to register at the yourself. Mm. Uh, so that means it depends the structure, but you don't. You just have to report to the French tax return. Um, Next, the, the next, next year, year. So that means yeah, 2024, next. you have to report for May, June 2025. Yeah. So, so taxes, <laughs> yes, it's not instant. It's the next tax season you'll have to report. Yes. Like you become instantly elig eligible for French taxes, but on the next tax season, social charges, then it depends how it much depends. turnover you're making 
and if you are an LMNP, then we get back to this acronym or not. Yes, and if you exert as, uh, as a company, you have to register immediately to the of tax. Of course, that, yeah, it, then it's it, different. It really depends the situation, but... Uh... Okay, this one, uh, I'll try not to trick you, Sandra. So if you don't have the answer, it's okay, because it, it's there's a bit of an inheritance uh, role in there. Can a JIT be owned by a SIRL, so a French LTD, so by a French SIRL de famille, by two siblings, and is there a strategy to mitigate inheritance tax between them? So yes, uh, JIT can be owned by an SRL de famille because an SRL de famille, it's uh, you, you have SRL de famille. It's like uh, I, it's the same regime that individual, like I, I exposed for, from a tax point it's of view. It's a mix between self-employed and LTD. Yes, it's basically. a mix be between the two because SRL de famille, you can exercise as income tax and not corporate tax so mm. you can you can exercise and for inheritance tax um, you can make something called dismem dismemberment of property for me it's dismemberment a, yeah dismemberment de propriété, de propriété. Uh, that means you have the other fruit and the bare ownership uh, for both of you so we, we could discuss about something like that, but if you have uh, 50% of the SRL de famille and you just have the full, um, or you are full ownership of 50%, if one of you die, you have to pay taxes in France and uh, between siblings, we have a high, um, high taxes. Oh yeah, Be uh, between siblings, yeah. Between siblings, it's high. But it, it, is there a way to improve on the situation. Like if we anticipate on that, can we yes. try to lower the, the inheritance tax? Okay, yes. Okay, the strong, mm -hmm. short answer, yeah. I, li I like it. You can make <laughs> some planning to to uh, to manage the- um, Like it was called, like, like the demembrement, for example. Demembrement, yeah. it's an example. So basically, just because it's a bit weird, basically we, we can separate, in a way like split, like the, the, like the ownership of the property and, and the use of it. That, that's what we call demembrement. Like, like we can split this and put a price tag on it. But obviously when someone dies, like the use like vanishes. Uh, and so like, this is how we, we do like tax stunt to avoid the tax ban on, on in, in returns rules. But this is kind of a, a high level kind of stunt. So it requires some specifics. So that's why Sandra is just touching base on the topic. But in, in fact, it's, it's the best solution for, um parents and children for siblings I'm it will be more complicated because in fact for parents and children you you suppose that parents die before the children so you can yeah. put a better um, estate uh, to uh, you can make a better planning to for the estate but you can have maybe some solution but okay. in fact you, you can run you can run a SRL de famille uh, between two siblings it's for sure <laughs> One last, because uh, it's, uh, it's going to be light for some here. Uh, one last question from Beverly. Uh, hello, Beverly. So just to be clear regarding CIRET registration. Uh, so by the way, CIRET is the, the acronym that we, we call the French registration number, the French business registration number, sorry. Uh, my husband and I are British tax resident in France on a five years carte de séjour. Congratulations on this. We both have Siret numbers as micro-entrepreneur. Uh, he is a petit bricolage. Um, I see artisan here, okay. Uh, and I am art teacher running art courses, profession libérale. Okay, so basically one micro-entreprise artisan, one micro-entreprise profession libérale. Do we need to register a, a site as an other business with separate CIRET number, I suppose that's in regard to a JIT. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting question. Yes, you have, because like I said before, uh, as micro-entreprise, it depends on the, the nature of your uh, profession. So that means for artisan profession liberal, it's not the same. So for, for the, the deductions are, aren't are, the same. Yes, they, they the have deductions are not yeah. the same, and you don't. Uh, and uh, you, you have, um, for the French tax return, it's not in the same box. So you cannot have an activity, you cannot have a micro-entreprise for multiple activities, unless if it's connected activity, oh. like I don't know, a, um, a lawyer that makes some um, some courses for um, hmm. for a student, it's connect activity, but in your situation, you have to register a new activity because you will have new uh, deduction, and, it's not the same. But, 
but is that possible then? I mean, can you have multiple micro entreprises or? You can have multiple okay. micro entreprises. So, but it's just but that they need careful, to register a separate careful, business. Yeah, okay. Be careful because the 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 turnover can be calculated with combined. all the entreprises combined. With it depends on nature if you have. Oh. So it's very important to be sure that if you run a JIT, you 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 don't uh, exceed the threshold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, it might impact both businesses because yes, it might increase the. Yes. Because if uh, well, by the way, guys, this is. Obviously, uh, the micro entreprise. If you exceed the threshold, then you might be automatically put in the the other category, which is the entreprise individuelle with completely different tax rates. And obviously, if you didn't anticipate on that, then you probably wouldn't have made any deduction, and you'd get you'd be it full force uh, with the taxes. So, when I mean, France, I mean, France is all about anticipation. As Sandra was saying, uh, if you anticipate on things, usually there is a way. Uh, uh, and, and it's probably a French specific sign. Like if there is a will, there is a way. Like, so yeah, like there is, if, if you consider things, if you want to do things, there's probably a way to do it in France. There's probably a way to avoid most of the taxes or to have like a reasonable taxation rate and stuff. But that implies you've planned ahead. If you didn't, odds are I that you'd be hit full steam and ends the reputation that France has. So France usually is a fairly good country, even tax related, uh, but you have to anticipate, maybe Catherine, as you've been living in France for a while, like what would be your comment on the, actually those taxes and stuff? I think, yeah, you do pay, we, you do pay more tax in France compared to the amount of tax you'd pay in the UK, but then you get an infrastructure that works and services that work and more benefits and family allowances and everything else. So it's very much swings and roundabouts. But, but, and as we've covered tonight, there are ways to effectively tax plan and minimize the amount of tax that you're paying. You just need to take the appropriate advice. And, you know, micro entreprise is ideal if you don't have many expenses to offset. But if you do, then you need to think about another business structure. And or that's where I think it's essential to, to take professional advice. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if you're making too much or exceed the thresholds, but also exactly. uh, just to uh, kind of, Compliment on what you, you just said, um, because you, you're one of the lucky few who moved to France at a very young age. And, and so you've experienced the whole process, like you've worked in France, you've had ch children in France, you've raised kids here. And so you've seen it all. Um, but for those who would move to France as retirees, for example, they probably experience a lower taxation rate because then you've experienced social charges and stuff. And so, so also, I mean, to, to put that into perspective, that's what I'm saying. Um, well, um, so now I think we can say it's a wrap, uh, uh, guys from the audience, the ones who went through the hour, almost and a half, uh, if you, if you can send emojis, hearts, whatever, thumbs up, whatever you get, you have in stock. I think the, the panelists will, will appreciate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the love. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you. it's been a pleasure having you tonight. It's been a pleasure for the... You in the audience, thank you for joining us uh, every session. So, num so many of you. We will send a follow-up email with the details of the panelists so that you can get in touch with them. And we'll also share your questions to them uh, if they want to reach out to you directly um, after this event. And obviously, for those who uh, may be joining at a later stage, uh, we would publish this uh, on our YouTube channel uh, so that if you want to see the replay or catch up with things that we might have said. Thanks again for um, everything. We we'll call it for tonight. Um, see you soon, guys. Bye, Sandra. Bye, Kat. Bye. Bye-bye. See you all. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.